it's online. Normally it takes us three hours before we start recording. We now just <laughs> broke our own record. <laughs> so it's such a nice guy, friend. <laughs> but it's true. We always need a little bit of warm up, right? We need a bit, little bit of warm up. Yeah. So Didier and I, we are both Hyper-V uh, MVPs and uh, we, we, we came to the crazy idea to do showcasts, so demonstrate the, the fe features in Hyper-V, the great features. Mike, what's happening here? <laughs> in case you don't know us, that's us. The, the red pepper, that seems to be Carsten. Yeah, the red pepper, I'm the red pepper. The green pepper, that's me. We are all sorts of stuff. <laughs> all sorts of stuff. <laughs> I'm a consultant, he is a civil servant. Okay, right. And an MVP, and a Meet member, and a rock star, and a Cisco champion. Even. I'm a Cisco champion, yeah. So, and we do a lot of stuff with Hyper-V. Yeah. Okay, so let's show some of those. Huh? So this is a list of what we're going to try and show. This is probably not going to work out due to time limitations, but at least we're going to try. And the order isn't really that important. So I'll just start. And I'll start with, is this going to work so close to the, huh? There is a, I don't know. We can move it a little bit, huh? What do you think? Yes. So in IT, you have to make it work. This is agility in action. <laughs> agility in action. Am I the problem or you? I'm the problem. No. The same. It's it's the bash. No, it's me, I guess. Lose the batch. Put it a bit lower. That's good. Okay. Yeah. What's this in my pockets? All the shit I'm <laughs> I've been stealing. That's the microphone. Okay. Okay. There we go. Uh, where's my remote desktop session? It's over here. Uh, storage cost is for later, but we might as well start with it because I've got it open. We don't see anything. You don't see anything. That's very annoying. Why are you not seeing anything? I said duplicate. Which should mean we duplicate something. Three. Ah, there we go. Now you see something. I've got a VM running here. It has something that's called IO meter. Uh, I had a remote desktop session, I think. Hello network. OK, it's back now. Uh, we're going to generate some IOPS, basically. I think the number is very nice. It's nice, isn't it? What is your storage system? Some uh, crazy expensive stuff? No, absolutely not. It's dirt cheap and very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, oh, come on. Let's see. Let's create some IOPS. Is it running? Yes. I hope it is. is it? No, it's not running. No, it's not running for some reason. Or? Okay, let's try it again. Uh, you have to start it, all right? It's started. It's, yeah, yeah it's I think no, it's, it's Let's see if it's running. Let's just demonstrate storage class. We're going to go into the settings of the VM, and we're going to go into the hard drive, and there's advanced features. You can enable storage class, and we're going to give it a maximum of, let's say, 2,000. And let's see if we can make this kick in. Maybe you should lower the update frequency. Push start. Oh yeah, it's not running. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. Maybe your update uh, frequency is not one second, so you don't see it so much. Could be. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I know what you mean. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, we're wasting time here. Oh come on, start. Yeah, it's it's the update frequency. It's at 2,000 right now. Basically, what we just showed you, or sort of showed you, is that you can, on the fly, reduce the, I, the, the IOPS on a virtual machine. So if you have a runaway virtual machine, you can, without any downtime, just limit it to a certain amount of, of, of IOPS, which is kind of great. Uh, it's good for runaway virtual machines. It's also great for if you have virtual machines that need uh, a predictive uh, or predictable uh, performance. If you do VDI, 
And you don't want one person to have 10,000 IOPS at one moment in the morning, but you want to have everybody to have 200 or 300 IOPS all day long. You just limit each and every, each and every single virtual machine to that same amount of IOPS, and then the, the performance and the experience will be the same all over the all over the, 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 the day and the weeks, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't have people who think, hey, it was blazing fast yesterday, and now it's slow. So that's one thing you can do with that. You also have minimum IOPS, but that's only an alert. You'll get an alert if you listen for it, if you are not uh, getting your minimum IOPS. So I'm going to just uh, call it a, a day here with this one. Can I ask you first question? Yes, I okay. can try. I actually use this and find it very accurate. But I don't understand why the IOPS from Hyper-V, they are on 8K blocks. Why Microsoft decided to choose 8K blocks? It's very hard for me to explain why Microsoft decided something, but they needed to normalize the way they measured IOPS. And they, they chose that way to do it, and it actually makes sense if you look at most IOP tools, how they try to visualize IOPS. And it's not really measuring the exact IOPS. It's a unit of, uh, it's actually used to, to, to calculate costs. It's not to calculate IOPS as they are in 100% correct. They just want to have an average that they, that they can use for showback, internal billing, or troubleshooting. By the way, it's 33,521.789 IOPS, they don't care. They want to know whether it's 32,200, 33,200. So if you, if you normalize all the IOPS that's happening, then you get a, a common currency that you can use to do that. That's basically the reasoning behind it. Okay, what we're now going to demonstrate, at least I hope we are, is virtual RRS and DVMQ. To make that happen, I have two virtual machines. One virtual machine that will be receiving network traffic and another virtual machine that is going to send it. Basically, the virtual machines that's sending it isn't the most interesting one, but we need at least <coughs> that virtual machine to show up so I can start the network traffic. So where is my, oh, did I close it? Was I this stupid? Mm -hmm. Okay. My super secret password. Don't even try to guess it. Okay. So we can dump this one. And we kick off some network traffic from virtual machine one to virtual machine two. The thing we're interested in, of course, is two. Let's make this as big as we can. Look at the network traffic. Uh, it's not as successful as sometimes, but we're now getting 30 gigs, around 30 gigs from one virtual machine to another. The way we achieve that is by enabling virtual RSS. That means if you look now at Task Manager, you will see that it takes multiple CPUs to uh, load balance the, the interrupts it needs to handle that amount of traffic. And that is something that used to be impossible in the past. It just you are limited by the capability of core zero within your virtual machine. So now as long as you can throw the cores at it, a virtual machine can handle, the maximum I've seen is about 38. I, I, I think the limit must be somewhere near, near 40 gigabits per second. Now if you think about it, for a virtual machine that's quite impressive. That the two VMs are in the same host? They're in the same host because I'm now demonstrating the maximum capability of the virtual machine. If you are running between two different hosts, the only thing that's limiting you there is the bandwidth you have between the hosts. And unfortunately, unless you want to sponsor me, I have no 40 gig uh, network between the hosts. If you do have that kind of money, I'll gladly take it off your hands. <laughs> No? Okay. I thought as much. <laughs> now, this virtual RSS only works because we have something else. And if you look at the host, you can see it a little bit. Uh, the problem is my hosts are quite capable, so it's not... It's not that obvious, but actually there are multiple cores here now working to provide that throughput to the virtual machine. And that's something that we already had. We had VMQ in the past, so you could scale IOPS on the host, but it, it tied one core to one virtual machine. 
So they changed that model whereby it became dynamic. So that was DVMQ. So basically you start off with one core. If you need more, you'll get another. If you need more, you'll get a third and so on. But that means that you now have a dynamic mechanism that will scale the cores on the host and the virtual machine with virtual RSS can leverage that uh, capability to handle all the bandwidth. This might seem like DJ, why would you ever need it? But we were in a business where we copy around massive amounts of data. So for us, this is actually kind of cool. How did you do, how did you virtualize a large system that copies terabytes of data in the past? You were limited by your bandwidth that you could, that you, or you were limited by uh, the CPU. Now all these limits are gone. So you actually, it's not a, it's, it's a bit of a marketing team, but Microsoft is right. You can, if you do it correctly, virtualize high performance, large workloads. The only thing you have to remember is it's not magic. So if you, if you can't deliver 10 gigabit physically, you will not be able to deliver it uh, virtualized. You, you, you've, you have to have the bandwidth. Basically, that's uh, very important. Okay, let's uh, close this one. And let's close this one. Uh, let's get rid of it. We have another virtual machine. It's called OnMap Demo OVM, but it does two things. It's going to demonstrate uh, both OnMap and ODX at the same time. So basically what we have here is a virtual machine that has all types of virtual disks uh, attached to SCSI controllers. And we're going to copy some data in there. Just, is it me? Oh. OK. Minus. Okay. We're going to, so. What we're going to do, in the interest of time, I'm going to kick off some scripts. And in those scripts, I'm going to copy data into fixed size VHD, fixed size uh, VHDX, uh, dynamic size, uh, dynamically expanding VHDs, dynamically expanding VHDXs. And we are going to see what happens both on the SAN and uh, on the, uh, the hosts with the files of, of the virtual disks. So we have a little PowerShell tool to do that. Uh, where are my scripts here? So basically, the, this is a script that, ma that monitors the file size of the virtual disks. And then we have another one, and this shows you how much space we are actually consuming on the SAN. So the SAN is thinly provisioned, so we have a LAN of 10.5 terabytes, but at the moment we're only using 205 gigabytes. That's what you're seeing here. For some reason, and you'll, uh, you'll understand this, the fixed size VHDs are their fixed size, but the dynamically expanding ones, well, they don't have any data in them yet. So that's what you're seeing here. So now we go to the virtual machine. If I can find it again somewhere. That's annoying. Ah. No, go away. Go away. OK. Actually, kind of cool if you have a larger resolution, but it is over here, so let's go. We'll copy some data into a fixed site VHD that goes quite fast. Don't you, do you like it? That's the speed of copying data inside of a virtual machine. Now, let's do it with a VHDX. That goes quite fast as well. Hey, there's no difference. How does this come? I thought VHDXs were supposed to be more performant than VHD. You're not seeing the performance of the virtual disk. You are seeing ODX in action. This is why we like ODX. We tend to copy around lots of data. So we like VRSS because we can transport it over the network. We like ODX because we can throw data around in, inside of virtual machines and to different virtual machines uh, bypassing the storage IOPS limitations. So pretty cool. Now, of course, you should notice here that the sizes didn't change because a fixed size VHD, well, basically, it's already the size it needs to be. Now, let's play the same game with a dynamically expanding VHD and a dynamically expanding VHDX. Using ODX. ODX is enabled in all the demos, but you'll see a difference. So we'll start with the VHDX, and you'll see that it's quite fast. There's a little overhead of you have to expand the VHDX, but it's pretty impressive. And then we'll do the other one. And what are we seeing here? ODX is enabled. What you are seeing here, in reality, 
is the difference in capabilities of a dynamically expanding VHD versus a VHDX. If you are not convinced right now that VHDX is a way better format, I should slap you around the head or something because I don't know, I don't know what to do else to convince you. I, I used to be very skeptical about, oh, our dynamic VHDXs are, are, are at the same performance level of the fixed sizes. I have tested it at length, and I have to agree, it's true. I was pleasantly surprised by that one, but this one made, did, made, made the difference for me. This is like, this is humongous improvement. And the reason for that is? It's not, it's, 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 it has ODX, but it's very, it's a lot less efficient uh, in expanding itself than a VHX. The VHX uses bigger assignments of blocks. It's optimized to have a uh, better performance. So if you, if you do virtualization on Hyper-V today and you have Windows 2012 or higher, use VHDX. There's many other reasons, but I don't have time to demo those. But you should look at something. You have seen now that we have added data into the dynamically expanding VHDXs. It has grown. You, ha you will also see that the size consumed on the SAN have, have, has grown. So uh, I have another demo where I copy it into a disk that has two volumes uh, formatted to show you it works on the disk level, not on the LUN level. I have one where I copy it into a VHDX that attached to an IDE controller because it on map also works with an IDE controller. What you don't have there is ODX. And I'm going to just do this one because it has an interesting other side effect that it will demo. Want to show, uh, RDMA? Uh, they have seen RDMA already if they, went, if they came to my session. But look at this. This is a dynamically expanding uh, VHD on an IDE disk. That supports on map but not ODX. So this is the speed of a dynamically expanding uh, VHDX when you lose ODX. But it's still faster than a VHD that has ODX. So that's kind of an interesting scenario, right? That also shows the superior performance of a VHDX. And now we've copied all that data. You have seen here that the SAN has grown a bit more and the file sizes have grown a bit more here. And what we're going to do now, and I should have put this in a script as well. I know, I realize, I apologize. I should have written a script that deletes everything. So now I have to del shift delete these because I don't want them to be in the recycler bin. No, come on. No, I don't want to play. Uh, and then we did, I think, was this, this was the one, I think. Uh, no, where is it? Uh, it's over here. <coughs> Delete it. So it's all gone. Now we have a little script. Normally this is a process that will happen in the background. That's trim. It's going to run as part of your scheduled maintenance anyway. But it can take a while, so we're just forcing it. And just to be on the safe side, we'll force it again. But look here, normally if you look at this, the amount of storage used on the uh, sand has already dropped. It's already passed to the, to, to the physical layer. And when you shut down the virtual machine, you should see the dynamically expanding disks also be reduced in size. So let's just shut this one down. We've run retrim twice. That should be sufficient. And let's see what happens here. It's off. As you can see, the dynamically expanding VHDX has dropped to its starting size. The dynamically expanding VHD does not, because it does not support unmap. So if you have virtual machines where you copy. You explain, I set up to my node. OK. Right? OK. I'm making a lot of noise. So basically what's, <laughs> happening, what's happening here is that you can recuperate uh, space that you, that you otherwise would lose. Because your SAN is thinly provisioned and it gets informed about the fact that you have deleted data and that storage can be reused. But also on the virtual layer, 
you have the same effect. Because what's the benefit here? If you have dynamically expanding disks, it's not about shrinking the file. That's something that happens only when you close down the VM, which is nice if you have a VM where you just deleted five terabytes and you want to reclaim some space. But the most important thing is the VHDX now knows that the space is free immediately, and it doesn't have to expand because it knows about the empty space in the virtual machine disk. So that takes away the overhead of expanding the dynamically expanding disks too much because you are using your empty space inside of your virtual disk a lot better. And that's the benefit. And it seems like an artificial demo, but if you do uh, this on a production environment over the course of a year or a couple of years, uh, I've seen uh, people who enabled uh, OnMap or Vi on, on uh, VMware recuperate as much as 20 to 25% of, of space. And if you translate that in storage you might have to buy to keep your business running, it's quite interesting to have that capability. So it's not something like, hey, look, my file has shrunk. No, it's more about the fact that you do not waste a single gigabit of space, which translates into money. And for some reason, businesses are in business to make money. So now my colleague here, the red pepper, also known as Karsten, <laughs> is almost ready to do his part of the, yes. of the job. Now, uh, we don't have time to do uh, the live migration demos. But Where is the backslash? But ah, here it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Ooh, Belgian keyboard. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You ask, you ask QWERTY. <laughs> it's you yes, ask QWERTY. I am. <laughs> but it's not German QWERTY, so that's why. why. No. Okay. But, but are you ready? Yes. I'll shut up. You shut up. Nice. So I'm so unfortunate to show you some features from Windows Server 2016 TP2. And uh, how much time do we have left? Didier? I have no clue. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> show the 23 stuff. 23 minutes. <laughs> 23. 23 minutes. Oh, really? Yeah, I okay. Fast. Okay. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> so I must think about what we want to show you. Um, one feature is in, uh, in Windows, Windows Server 2016 with Hyper-V. Uh, we have now, when we use ReFS instead of NTFS, ReFS is a new Windows file system that will be, I hope, the primary file system in 2016. We have the possibility when we merge um, virtual disks, so we have a differentiating disk and merge it into, the, into a normal disk. We normally, with NTFS, we copy all the blocks into the old disk and after that the disk is deleted. Maybe you have noticed that if you, if you uh, delete a snapshot uh, on the disks, the normal disk grows up to um, the size that every block is copied to that one, and then it, uh, the, the HVD, VHDX file is deleted. And it takes a lot of time because all the data is physically copied into the disk. And you need the space. And you need the space, of course, because, because your first disk grows, so every block is copied there that is not present there, and after that the space is freed. So I can show you that with, an NT, with a virtual machine on an NTFS file system. I have this VM on NTFS and I have here two volumes on this external SSD. One is formatted with NTFS. This one, we have a VM in there and when we look here in the virtual disk we see a uh, 20, ah, sorry, the mouse and I we have to get comfortable with each other. So the size here is 27 gigabytes. So I have an H, I have an, a snapshot that is 27, giga, 27 gigabytes large. So when I merge this, you should see that the, the real VHDX file should grow up to 35 gigabytes. The data is copied there. And after that, the 27 gigabytes will be deleted. Maybe you know that already. It's an SS SSD, sh so it shouldn't take so long. Where is my Hyper-V manager? Here it is. And I had already opened 
the right window. Okay. No, I haven't. So I will remove the snapshot. So, delete checkpoint. Yes. And then we come back to our screen. You, so you should see the VHDX growing. So all the data from the, VH, from the HVHDX is now copied into the VHDX. So I need more space on my storage to merge it. And when the data is there, the 27 gigabyte will be deleted. Okay? We come back to that. You see it's growing. Now I want to show it, uh, show it to you with REFS, with the new file system. I've prepared for that. We can look later in this one. So I've prepared another VM uh, on an REFS file system. We have again a 27 gigabyte snapshot. It is already. It's it's already in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, you don't know. It's a valid question. It's ReFS. I don't know where. Resilient, it, file, resilient file system. Yeah. So now I have a VM here, and here I will also delete uh, the checkpoint. And we look here. It's done uh, maybe. You shouldn't see that. <laughs> That's a nice surprise. <laughs> but it's much faster, right? We shouldn't see that. That's maybe a bug. Which which are you? TP2, the buggy one. Oh, yeah. But you saw it was much faster. You shouldn't see the growing of the. No, you have to see it. But the other one is decreased. You saw it? Yeah. It is de decreased while the process, so we don't need more space. One is increasing, the other one is decreasing. With NTFS, it should, should still, maybe still run. Let's see. This is the NTFS volume with, uh, it's still running. So you saw, ReFS is much faster, maybe 15 to 20 se seconds. Um, and NTFS is still running. And here we have the increase of the space. With ReFS, we didn't have the increase. It's one is decreasing, the other one is increasing. OK? So this was one demo I prepared. If it's GA. And it should work correctly when it's GA. The, the problem, I think, with our, our ReFS is that, it, it, if I'm right, it does not yet support ZD. Right. right. And it will not support ZD. Uh, maybe I'm not so sure about that. You're sure? You're also sure? I know they are working heavily on it. They don't make it, do you think? Not for the VMs. Okay. It's okay to be used in a VDI environment. Yeah, yeah, but not for the VMs. VDI is VMs at the end of the day, you know. So. At, at, this, at, at this moment, the only supported DDM scenario is for VDI or for DDM backup card. Yeah, that's about it. They might change that, but unless you use MTFS, you're not going to see the benefit because in REFS, it's not available. It might become available later, but it will not be next. It will be VDI. <laughs> and I hope my fellow MVPs are not right on this one. So there's still time. And we hope as well. We want to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all want to be wrong on that one. My best guess of it. Yeah. That okay. I'm I'm with you. Yes. You don't see anything? But afterwards <laughs> I'll talk about the benefits of our VFS and then you want it even if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next one, um, I need some credentials for that. So I will do that. So now I have, oh, let's, let's skip this one. Let's take the Linux one. So I should collapse the region and then do that. So I hope it works. Yeah, we have now here an, a Linux machine. 
and I the connect is taking a while. So if you look here, I uh, I asked the setting. It's a generation two VM. So generation two is based on Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi system, and we can start it up. But uh, the it isn't generation two, but Secure Boot is disabled, so we can use our uh, our Linux-based machine without Secure Boot. I started it. Now I will shut down it again, and will enable Secure Boot in the script. So now you see here, Secure Boot is enabled, and when I now try to start the virtual machine, if my setup is correctly, it can't boot because. Secure boot is not supported in Linux. You see, it, it didn't find the hard disk. So I will sh turn it off again. And now I change the secure boot template. There's a special one for uh, Linux. It's called Microsoft Wi-Fi Certificate Authority. And you see here, we have changed the secure boot template, and the secure boot is still on. So I try to start the VM again. And I grab a little bit of this beer. Is that necessary to make it work? Yes, you need beer for that. <laughs> so it's starting. So when you change, now Secure Boot is supported in Renext with a Linux system. You have to change the Secure um, the secure boot template for that, but it works with Linux also. So when we are in Linux, there are some other nice advantages in Windows 2016. I still have, have to get used to that name. So I'm not quite a Linux expert anymore. I have done Linux in the past, but it's a long, long ago. So uh, you see here the network configuration, and we have one wired card connected to the system. So in Windows 2016, when you have a generation 2 VM, you can now add network adapters while the system is running. You can add them and remove them. And this is, of course, not a problem in Windows, but what with Linux? So I add another card while the Linux system is running. And when this window go away, we see we have another network card. So this is possible to add and also remove um, network cards while the system is running. This is new for Hyper-V. Um, I'm quite not sure with other virtualization platforms. I think VMware is not a, has have de delivered this feature a long time ago, right? I think so. Yeah, but I don't know. So we can remove it, but uh, I don't do that. I will change to a Windows-based system. Did uh, did Aiden show demos in this session? No, we did not. Okay. Okay. I was not here on Friday, so that's not the server manager. It's a Hyper-V manager. Come on, come on, boy. So here we have. Uh, no, we we take a running one. So I take one of those. I have to log in. Come on. So another feature that is coming with the next version of the Windows Server is you can now modify the amount of memory a running machine is consuming. And this is this was possible or is possible with dynamic memory, but not a lot of people use dynamic memory. Your applications maybe have problems with dynamic memory, and uh, a lot of administrators want to, uh, want to specify how much memory uh, a system has. So if you say, I have 4 gigabytes for my system, it will start with 4 gigabytes, run, and also will be shut down with 4 gigabytes. And in the next version, it is possible, I, uh, this keyboard is, no, OK. It is possible to change the static memory of a running virtual machine. So I will open the task manager. More details. Let's see performance. 
So we, you see this machine has one gig of RAM. And we go into the configuration in the settings. Memory. It's not dynamic memory configured, it's static memory. So I can now change the amount of memory the system has. You see now it said it has four gigs. Oh, that was too much. Maybe I, I entered one zero more than I want to. I didn't do that here because my system has not so many memory, but I can also downsize it. So let's say we want only two gig. And you see here it's on two gig. Here it's on two gig because the used memory is now more, but here we have a little bit of a bug. It's not shown here correctly. No? So this is another feature with WinX that, that are minor features, but they are quite useful. You can add and remove network cards, and you can add and remove memory. I didn't try it under Linux. We can do that, but I, I honestly don't know where I can see the memory the system uses. Oh. It, hmm? Top. 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 Oh, yeah, there was this, this statistics. Hey, OK. So I will try it next time. I have to show you something else. So then uh, when you were in my, uh, my talk about uh, storage, who was in, in the talk about storage? OK, my, some of the people I know. I talked about storage spaces direct. This is a new feature in uh, Windows 2016 where you can use the storage in your system, the SATA disks, the SAS disks, on, and the NVMe disks to build a highly available storage system. You need four servers, use the disks that are in the servers. So imagine maybe a, a Dell R7030 with 24 slots. You can put SSDs in there and uh, normal disks, so uh, um, uh, slow disks. And if you have four or more of those servers, you can build uh, um, storage spaces direct, is it, is it called. Yeah? So I have prepared the, uh, such a thing in virtualization that's possible with VHDXs. So we see here um, actually a four-node failover cluster with local disks. And we can use it. My benchmark machine that I didn't see here, nice. Where is it gone? Here. It's running on this cluster. There's, the resolution is quite challenging. <coughs> so I also will start an IO meter here. One that refreshes. One that refreshes, maybe. I will prepare it. So let's do 4K IOs. Come on. So I have not the quite impressive IOs that Didier showed you. I have only 400, 400 of those. That's not, that is not the point. I want to show you something else. So this system is based on a file server that is called scale uh, SOFS, so for scale out file server. And if we look for the hard disk, we see scale out file server share two benchmarks. So it's, it's running on my storage spaces direct, on my four node cluster. Yeah? And what I'm doing now, I turn off one of those nodes. So one of those nodes has a, a, a motherboard problem or even a blue screen. I don't know if 2016 will ever blue screen, but assume that at will. So I turn it off. So you see now, the I.O. is gone. My, my uh, disk is not running. If this demo goes well, the I.O. will come back after some seconds, so maybe 30 seconds. In that case, it's freeze what? The I.O. is in the moment. Uh, the I.O. to the storage system is frozen. 
It's thank back. You. Okay, thank you. Um, we have four nodes. The I/O is spread over the four nodes, at least over three. Every block is on three nodes, and I turned off one of them. So the system will lose resiliency. I turned off one of the four nodes. Five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, and now it's back. So it's uh, it tolerates the failure of one of those nodes. Yeah. So I have a I have a PowerShell script that will applications fail. If no, I uh, there are some applications that have a problem if if they're if they're writing to a disk and they can't always write it, but these applications will fail in every scenario. If you have a Hyper-V cluster with uh, with storage and you lose the connection to your storage system, the Hyper-V cluster will will go to another node and you need a failover, so, so there will be an outage of 30 seconds or something. I don't agree, but we'll take this offline. You I don't agree? Setups, I have setups that can do this. Oh, we can talk about it, but uh, you, there are special setups, but normally you have an outage of the I.O. for some seconds, at least. And every application should tolerate that. There are applications that don't. But here you see the I.O. is up again. So. I have a PowerShell script for that, uh, that leveraged another new very cool feature, but maybe it takes a little bit to understand it. There is PowerShell Direct. So we can now, from a host, connect to a virtual machine that is running on the same host and leverage PowerShell commands. I don't need a network for that. I don't need TCP IP setup. The machine is running on the host, and I can use PowerShell to go into the host and do command there. And I do that. It's, it's hard to demonstrate. So I now um, I take this region here. I hope it's working, PowerShell Direct. I already have started this screen, so the important part is what you see here. I'm asking the storage system about the health of the pool and about the health of the virtual disk. And you see there, every two seconds, my pool is degraded. So it's not, it's not in the optimal state. And also, my virtual disk, one is incomplete and one is degraded. So my, my storage system is not healthy, but it's working. So if I now start up my, my missing node, It will come up again, and hopefully, my storage system, you will see a repair job. I also asked for, for uh, if there are storage jobs running. Yeah? Storage jobs is my storage system detects, oh, I have to do something like repair a virtual disk, because there is something wrong here. Uh, now you see it, regeneration of the two virtual disks. So we are still not healthy, but the system that had a blue screen is coming back online and your storage system is repairing itself. So I have not much more time. I normally want to show you how I can extend a four node um, storage basis direct cluster with a fifth node. So the concept is you use your four nodes. They are used maybe by 90% and you need more space. With storage spaces direct, you can add another server with local disks and the system will then, if you add it to the to this uh, cluster, will spread all the, uh, the the data over five nodes. So in the moment we would see 90% use, and after adding another node, it will be spread and uh, um, leverage uh, will will um, put the data over the five nodes, and you have 70% of free space and can use all five systems for the I/O. So it should be ready any minute. It's ready, right? Everything is healthy again. Uh, TP2 is not the, could I say that on camera? Will I lose my MVP? No. Yes. Uh, at once. <laughs> TP2 is not as stable as we wish. I would I say would, it that way. I would, I would say this if Greenfield only, if you're willing yeah. to lose the entire lab. It's and you can't even decently upgrade your one lab with TP. It's, it's really greenfield only. But it's still one the other way. Yes, I know. 
But I'm just giving out a warning if people are very enthusiastic yeah, start upgrading their, their existing lab on V1, uh, realize you're going to lose all the VMs that you have over there. You can't import new, new generation, new, new uh, version types of VMs. Most of the migration tools will fail with that. It's either you upgrade from 2012 R2 in your lab to V2, that might work a lot better. But from V1 to V2, I've had it. OK. So this was, this session was going as Didier and I mentioned it would be. It was a little bit chaotic because the kind of demonstration we did. It's realistic. It's realistic, yes. you live in chaos. chaos. So, I, but we hope you still get something out of it. We showed you some features we didn't we couldn't show you every, everything we want to because of the lack of time. But I hope uh, you see there is cool stuff already there uh, in uh, Windows Server 2012 R2. And there will be even more in 2016. As a general feedback, actually, to the audience, do you like longer sessions or do you like the fact that it's 30 minutes or 40 minutes? Something like this, it would have been nice to be much longer. Yeah, no, different. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I got those. <laughs> so we are finished. Yeah. So thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the...